All right, it is um, two o'clock, so we will get started. Uh, we have a little bit of Friday's lecture to finish, and then we'll pop right into today's stuff. So let me share my screen. All right, there we go. So we left off on Friday talking about um, just how to make acids, um, make acid solutions. But in biochemistry, generally, what we're more interested in are buffers. Now, a buffer is made out of, um, it's a solution made out of uh, both acid and its conjugate base. Just as a reminder, the only difference between an acid and its conjugate base is a proton. Now, for this system to work, both acid and base have to be uh, weak. If it's a strong acid or a strong base, that's not actually a buffer. So you need a conjugate pair and they both have to be weak. And if you don't remember what that means from general chemistry, a weak acid only gives a small proportion a small fraction of its hydrogens away when it's into water. Strong acid, 100% of it deionizes, a weak acid, small amount. Now what buffers do is that they will resist a pH change if you add a strong acid or base to it. And if we're working with a buffer system, um, we can determine the pH of our system using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation where pH equals pKa plus the log of base divided by acid. Uh, this pKa is called the acid dissociation constant. And remember, uh, every time you see P, you should think to yourself, minus log. So we're taking the negative log of the Ka, and Ka is actually the acid dissociation constant. And it's just a constant that any acid will have. Um, so every acid in existence has had this constant measured. Now, when we are um, looking at buffers, the best buffer or the uh, maximum um, protection a buffer can give is when its base equals its acid. Right? So if the concentration of base equals the concentration of acid, that's more or less the maximum coverage an acid, or rather a buffer, can give in either direction. Because when the base equals its acid, right? So if the base equals the acid, that means this fraction here is equal to one, and the log of one is, is zero. So in this situation, the pH of our solution is equal to pKa. And a buffer only works uh, plus one or minus one of its pKa. Um, so let's say we have a buffer and its pKa is 4.5. That buffer is only good from a pH range of 3.5 to 5.5. If you go below or above that range, it's not going to work as a buffer. You're not going to stop any pH change. And that's what's happening um, when you see these curves just go wild. Um, you, are, you ran out of buffer. Your buffer's broken. Now, buffers are in um, our cells. They're in our blood. Um, and every organism, living organism, ha probably has some kind of buffer to go along with it. And so the example here is our blood buffer. Um, our blood is buffered by carbon dioxide. Um, so carbon dioxide is a gas and it cannot travel in the blood as a gas. Um, it will not dissolve at all. But we need to get rid of carbon dioxide as it's a product of respiration. So what we do is that we take this carbon dioxide and make it to carbonic acid. So I think that's carbonic acid off the top of my head. I might be a little wrong on the um, formula there. But we turn into carbonic acid, 
And the carbonic acid is a weak acid, so it will form a buffer um, of our blood, which will roughly make our blood stay at 7.3. Now, when we do things like hyperventilate, One of the things we're doing when we're hyperventilating is that we are throwing off the concentration of CO2 in our lungs and sequentially our blood. And so what happens is that the pH of your blood will change because you're kind of running out of your buffer and you'll start to get dizzy and then eventually you're gonna pass out. Um, so that's just one way um, our blood buffer is helping us in that regard. Uh, H2CO3. Yeah, I thought I was missing an oxygen there. Uh, H2CO3. Um, and we'll get into actually how, how that works in chapter six, I think. But that's, that's just a, a buffer in real life situation. Yes, cool. I, I probably want to ask you on a test why, what happens during hyperventilization, but it's, it's just a neat fact, I guess. All right, so we're gonna work using this, uh, work on using this Henderson-Hasselbach equation. So I'll do question three for us, and then I'll let you do question four, and then we'll move on to DNA. Okay, so I have a one liter solution containing 10 milliliters of two mole of acetic acid and five grams of sodium acetate. What is a pH? given the pKa of acetic acid is 4.76. So we are doing some good old gen chem here to begin with. Um, remember I said, anytime we see a bracket, that means big M molarity. That means moles divided by liters. Um, so I need to know um, what is the concentration of the acid that I'm adding? and what is the concentration of the base that I'm at, right? So for the acetic acid, um, we can use the um, dilution equation that we used on our previous questions on Friday. So we're taking this two molar acetic acid and we're putting it into one liters. So basically we're diluting our acetic acid. And so to do that, to figure out the concentration of the acid, we can do M1B1 equals M2B2. So M1, I'm gonna call the two molar solution our first solution. And I'm gonna call our one liter the second solution. So imagine you're in the lab and the first thing you do is you're making this acid solution, right? So I take, a solution that's two molar, and I take 10 milliliters from it. I'm gonna make a new solution. I don't know the molarity, that's why I'm doing this, so that's a constant. And the volume is a thousand milliliters. So I converted um, liters to milliliters because your volumes have to be the same unit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 20 divided by a thousand, because I'm solving for M2, our molarity of our new solution is 0.02 molar, right? So that's the concentration of my acid. Base, I give you a weight, so we need to convert grams from moles, and we do that using our molar mass. So I have five grams of sodium acetate. And for every 82 grams, I have one mole of a sodium acetate. Grams cancel out, I'm left with moles. And the number of moles of a sodium acetate I have are 0 0.061. However, in the henderson hasselbach it is a bracket, so I want molarity. Molarity is moles divided by liters. How many liters do we have? We have one liter. So it's actually the number of moles is the same as molarity in this case. Molarity of our base is 0 0.061. 
now we have everything we need to set, uh, uh, solve our henderson hasselbach equation. So pH equals pKa. Well, pKa is 4.76 plus log. And then we have our base concentration, 0.061, divided by our acid concentration, 0.02. And then we can just calculate that. And here's a good um, tip before I give you the number. Everybody here should be at a level or hopefully very soon uh, be at a level that when you're doing problems like this, you should predict what the answer might look like so you know if you screwed up royally or not. For example, we're in a buffer, right? I just told you on the last slide, um, your buffer only works from a pH of plus one or minus one. So our, uh, a pH of plus one or minus one of your pKa. So your answer should be between 3.76 and 5.76. If you did a calculation and your pH was not in that range, you should, at this level, be cognizant of the fact that you messed something up in the calculation and go back. You should also look at your amount of base to acid. You should see that your concentration of base is higher than your concentration of acid. You have more base than acid. And what does a base do to pH? Makes the pH go up. So another thing that I would love you to be able to do, um, you know, when you leave this class is have those cognitive abilities of saying, okay, I have more base than acid. Therefore my buffer, the pH should be higher than the pKa. And it is pH equals 5.24. So it's in our range and it's higher than the pKa. So I can have some confidence that I did this problem somewhat right. I mean, don't know if it's 100% the right answer, but those are the kind of um, exercises that you should start to train yourself to go through um, to make sure that you know everything is logical. You set it up logical rather than the old general chemistry um, example of I'm going to type into my calculator and my calculator says that I'm going to assume it's right. Or another one I love is this number is big. It possibly can't be right. Well, it can be because we're working with big numbers. Um, anyways, any questions about anything I did there? If not, I will clear my scribbling and move on to question four. All right, so here uh, I give you the pH of a solution. I want you to tell me what the ratio of base to acid is using the henderson hasselbach equation and all the math skills we have learned. So I'll give you all a couple minutes to do this. Um, please let me know if you are unsure where to start or if you have an answer and you have it figured out already. Um, the worst thing you can do at this time is just sit and wait for me to tell you the answer. Um, that's a waste of your time. So let's use it productively and give you a couple minutes.
and if you get a solution and you want to check with me, feel free to send me a message as well. So there's a question, is there a way to tell how much base to acid specifically? Um, yes, there is a way. Uh, this fraction tells you the ratio of base to acid. For an example, if you got an answer of that fraction being two, a fraction of two is actually two divided by one. Any whole number can be divided by one. And so what that means in terms of base divided by acid is that you have a two molarity of base to two, uh, one molarity of acid. It's basically what that fraction means. So that, and, but the ratio would be two to one. All right, so that was a couple minutes. Um, one sec. Yeah, so we send out, set up our henderson hasselbach our favorite equation, pH equals pKa plus log base divided by acid. Um, by the way, in the future, you might look up this equation on the internet and you would see it acid divided by base. Um, that's fine. All that happens is that they flip a sign. So instead of plus, it's minus. But we're always going to use the form as written here. All right. So the pH is 4.25. pKa is 4.76 plus log. And I'm just going to abbreviate B divided by A. Okay, so we want our um, variables on the same, uh, our loan on one side, subtract 4.76 from each side. You get negative 0.51 equals log base divided by S. If you remember from Friday, if there's variables in a log, we can't touch it. The only way to get rid of a variable or get rid of the log is to take the power of 10 of each side power of 10 of a log cancels out and our fraction is base divided by acid our ratio is 0 0.309 and again we do this does this answer make sense to us first let's look at the range of our buffer our pk is 4.76 um so our first our so our range is 4.76, so this buffer only works from 3.76 to 5.76. So the pH we have in there, yeah, that's in that range. So then we look at the base to acid ratio. We see we have more acid than base because this number is less than one. Um, if this number was greater than one, we would have more base to acid, but it's less than one. Therefore, our, um, if we have more acid, the pH we're looking for should be lower than our pKa, and it is. Our pH was 4.25, which means we should have more acid to base, which we do. All right, and that ends our acid and base and water chapter. We're actually through chapter two of the book now. Um, that ends the math, big math section for a while. So those of you who hate math, um, don't, it's, it's a lot of pictures from now on. 
Um, so I'm gonna clear my scribbling. Yay, pictures, yep. Um, memorization, yay. Uh, so let me, how much do you care about significant figures? The real answer is I should care because I'm a teacher teaching science and general chemistry, I care a lot about it. And, and when you're doing real science, you should care about them because they matter. I often forget about them when I teach this class. Um, so not much and, and biochem. I don't care about them that much in that at this level, um, I really want to see that you can formulate through the logic. And if you forget sig figs, um, I probably won't be dinging you unless I like specifically say them in the question. But yeah, I, in biochem, I honestly, I just forget sometimes about sig figs, which isn't a good thing, but it happens. All right, so let me go to 831. And I think on online I said today was 821 in the PowerPoint. Um, last day of August. Feels like fall already. Um, I'm a little confused about the part where we took the 10th power. Sure, let me just do that real quick. So let's say we have a number, 2 equals log of x. And I'm trying to figure out the variable x. I cannot touch a variable that is in a log parenthesis. So if I'm taking the log of a variable, you can't do anything to that variable. You can't solve for it. You can't move it. You can't do anything until you get rid of the log. The way to get rid of a log is to take the power of 10 to both sides. So you do 10 to the power of 2 equals 10 to the power of log. Uh, the power of 10 and log are opposites of each other. So they cancel each other out. So if you try to take a log of every, you take your variable that's being logged, do the power of 10 to that log, they cancel out. So your answer here is 10 to the power of two or X is 200 or not 200, 100. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's 10 to the power of two. You're, we're always doing base 10. Yep, we always work with log base 10 in this class. In math class, you might work with log base something else. Biochemistry will never do that. We'll always do log base 10. Yeah. So we're gonna start with our first polymer of this class. If you remember way back in our first lecture, um, which was a week ago now, we talked about the four polymers we're gonna learn about. Uh, nucleotides, amino acids, lipids, and carbohydrates. And we're gonna start with nucleotides because DNA is, uh, well, is the memory bank of everything in the cell, basically. Um, you do everything in the cell based on what the DNA says. All right, now here comes our first, um, you need to know how to do this. And I don't know of a better way to do this than to ask you to memorize. So you need to know the structure of our five bases here, right? So you need to know what these look like. You need to know where they connect to our sugar. So where you see the X's here, this is where you're gonna form your covalent bond. And you always uh, form your covalent bond to position one one prime of your um, carbon. And I'll, I'll explain this in like the next slide exactly what's going on here or when we talk about how DNA is connected. But you need to know how to, what the base looks like, where it connects, what the sugar looks like. Um, so one, it's a ring with um, five carbons and an oxygen right here. And you have to know the difference between RNA and DNA. Simple enough, right? RNA, that's an OH right there. DNA, deoxy, 
doesn't. That's why it's called deoxynucleotide. Um, so that's going to be your first, I don't know a better way to teach it than to ask you to memorize it project. We have a couple of those because there's just some structures. But if you went through organic chemistry, uh, you have proven you know that skill quite well. Um, yeah, so we're just going to work on a couple of exercises today to show you the type of questions you could expect me um, to ask of you. Um, since this is an online class, I probably won't ask you to be drawing nucleotides, but um, recognizing nucleotides is where we're going to be at. So first, I have some nucleotides for you to name. So let's look at our first example of um, above A and B, and then I'll open up a poll so you can figure out what's the names of the other two nucleotides. So we're looking at the top here, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Um, so it's triphosphate because it has three phosphates right here. Um, our base, is adenine, so that's why it's adenosine. And although it's not in here, this is RNA. Um, ATP, GTP, CTP, all those TPs, they're gonna be RNA, it's not DNA. Um, so those are always RNAs. And that's how you name a simple nucleotide like that. Now I have A and B. Let me pull up a poll. Let's see if this poll would work. That's not the question. Yeah. Yeah. So for this poll, the way it works is that you can select uh, multiple answers. I think that's the way I set it up. So tell me, like, what base is it? And is it like a triphosphate, a diphosphate, or monophosphate? Just, just to get us looking at these structures. So we have that for A, and we have that for B. And while you work on that, I'll just tell you some fun facts about ATP. Um, you don't need to know this yet, unless you take Biochem 2, I think we talk about it, or maybe at the end of Biochem 1, I forget. Um, ATP is always thought of the energy molecule, and you've probably been taught that like, when you break a bond of ATP, you get energy out. Well, the fun fact is you actually have to put energy in to break that bond, you only get the energy out because one, you are separating negative charges and two, you are um, dissolving this in water. So like, it's not like a bond breaks and magical energy is released. Uh, usually what happens is that an enzyme takes that phosphate and puts it on itself. Then that phosphate is given off the water. And through that process, you are lowering the free energy of the universe and you're using that to do work. So now that we're learning biochemistry, we can start to learn fun facts like that. And another fun fact is that GTP, CTP, TTP, they all exist. Um, they're all, some of them are used for energy, not everything. Um, since you are part of the universe, breaking ATP to ADP lowers the free energy of the, of you. So therefore lowers the free energy of the universe. Don't forget, you are part of the universe. And when you think of free energy calculations, you actually take in the full free energy of the universe in those calculations, but we simplify it. You can go into the whole, whole backstory of that. Please don't think you are the universe. We are just small parts. All right. Um, we have uh, been going long enough for that. So we have guanosine diphosphate. Yep, that's what we're dealing with. That is a guanosine right there. And we have two phosphates. So that's diphosphate. Adenosine monophosphate, that is correct for B, also known as cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP, because you can see the phosphate here, when you're down to one phosphate, what will happen is that it will cyclize. 
Um, so that's why it's cyclic AMP. Um, this is a messenger molecule. Um, when you have cyclic AMP around in your cells, that means you are very low energy and then you start um, making energy. You start breaking down carbohydrates, start breaking down fat, all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, that is our basic fundamentals of looking at some nucleotides. All right, we're not all that interested in just nucleotides by themselves. They are important, ATP, GTP, but what we really care about are the polymers of nucleotides. And so we're gonna look at how nucleotides are connected. So we're gonna start all the way at the five prime end, all right? So the reason why it's called the five prime end is because our sugar molecules, all the carbons, are numbered one, two, three, four, five prime. They're given primes because the bases get the non-prime numbers. So you can see up there the bases are one, two, three, four, and our sugars are primes. So at the five prime end, we have a phosphate. The way we connect um, um, nucleotides, and this gets students all the time. It seems to be a very con confusing concept, um, so uh, make sure you pay attention here, is that a phosphate, one phosphate, the oxygen will be connected to the three prime of one sugar, and then it'll be connected to the five prime of another sugar. And that's how all DNA, all RNA are generally connected through this phosphate backbone, right? And when we read DNA in like any sequence, or if we read RNA, it is always, always, always printed five prime, the three prime. That's how we, we read it. Um, that's how a lot of enzymes read it. Not everything, there are some enzymes that go backwards, but this will go five prime carbon all the way to three prime carbon, right? And at the three prime end, you have an OA. Now, RNA is generally single-stranded as shown here, and we're actually looking at RNA, you can tell, because at the two prime position, there's an OH. So this is RNA we're looking at. Um, usually single-stranded can be double-stranded. DNA is usually double-stranded. Uh, it can be single-stranded. And if we're dealing with DNA that's double-stranded, we have to follow Shargaff's rule. A equals T and G equals C, because A, um, base, uh, a forms a, a hydrogen bond with T, G forms a hydrogen bond with C. So those are our basics of our nucleic acids. So what I want you to draw is I want you to draw a Cu RNA di uh, dinucleotide. See if you can get all of those connections correct. And why you work on that, I have a thought-provoking question for everybody. Why, why does DNA have T and RNA have U? What purpose could organisms have developed in evolution to have a nucleotide in DNA be different than a nucleotide in RNA, even though they say they have the same exact purpose of they can hydrogen bond with A, basically. So do some drawings to get that structure in your head of how things connect. And if you want a, a, a tougher question, why does T exist? Why not just make everything U? And when drawing the di dinucleotide, you only have to draw one side. You don't have to show me what it's hydrogen bonding to. Yeah. 
And then remember to draw it five prime to three prime. So one question is the methyl group of T reacts differently with other compounds. No, nope, that methyl group's super small. So generally it's not gonna make a difference. Um, I will say now that I say that, that methyl group, that is like the only difference, it, it does, it, it is important in one way to react with a certain enzyme, but generally it's so small that it's not gonna do, do that much difference. Nope, creating a T versus U is basically the same energy. And by the way, RNA came first. So RNA was first, DNA was second. So uracil came before thymine. Uh, another suggestion is stability. Uh, no, that methyl is not really gonna add anything to stability. It's not part of hydrogen bonding. It's not gonna really interact with anything to help it with stability. All, all good. Good answers. I like I like your thinking. And it's not obvious. It is not obvious at all. So I'm gonna start drawing now. So here's my five prime end. Um, I need to connect that to a carbon. Oxygen, this is RNA, so there's my OH. Three prime, connected to a phosphate. Connected to a uh, carbon, O, 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 OH, and OH. All right, so we have uh, C first, so that's Nitrogen, uh, double bond O, nitrogen, NH2. Oh, got to move that. And then some carbons. So there's our C, then I need to do U. So nitrogen, double bond O, nitrogen. Okay. So let's take a look at what you have been saying. Um, uracil is necessary for enzyme to recognize the stop codon during translation. So that's, I actually don't know if that's true or not, but I know it is in stops, but that does not explain why it's not in DNA. Uh, so for the detection and repair of mutations in the replication process. You are so close on that one. The only thing I would say is what, what mutations. Integrity of the DNA and genetic material. Don't want to mix up DNA and RNA, especially because some things can degrade RNA. Um, kind of, but I would say for that, you already have a difference in the sugar. So, and you can have, for example, you can have all A, 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 and you would not know if that was DNA or RNA, even though the two primes are different. Um, but since I drew it, um, all very good thoughts, very good thoughts. Uh, I'll give you the, the answer, at least what we think. Okay, inside your cell, your cytosine, about 10,000 times per day, per cell, this NH2 group, will spontaneously come off. It's, uh, it's called spontaneous deamination. It'll just happen um, 10,000 times in each one of your cells. When, when your NH2 comes off, what you're, what's gonna happen during that spontaneous deamination is that it will change that into a double bond O, right? Now look at the difference between cytosine in uracil, the only difference is that a uracil has a double bond O and the cytosine has an NH. So during spontaneous amination, which happens all the time, 10,000 times per cell, 
your cytosine spontaneously mutates to a uracil. Now, if you didn't have thymine, and the only difference between thymine and uracil is the CH3 group. If your DNA had uracil, your enzymes would not know that's an error necessarily. In fact, they wouldn't know it's, a, it's a really an error all that much. Um, there might be some strain in the hydrogen bonding patterns to let the enzymes know that, but it is possible that you'll just get a ton of C to U mutations. But we don't have U, we have thymine instead. So when your enzymes come across a uracil in the DNA, it knows that uracil is not supposed to be in the DNA. And so it will remove that uracil. We have enzymes that do that and replace it back with a cytosine because the only thing that mutates into a uracil is cytosine. So genetic integrity and counting mutations. So it is along those lines. Does the first phosphate have two double bonds? Um, I drew it with two double bonds. Um, it's a resonant structure where sometimes that double bond goes onto that oxygen. So um, yeah, it, you can draw it either way. It definitely has out, usually always has one double bond, sometimes two. Um, but yeah, that's your fun uracil thymine fact for the day. All right, um, so I will clear this. How do you start drawing? Um, I can draw because I'm the presenter. Um, oh, yeah, I drew the phosphate and then the sugar, if that's what you're asking. How do we draw the structure of five prime and three prime? It was one of them. Um, that's what I just drew. I drew a Cu RNA dinucleotide five prime to three prime. Um, here's the five prime end and it goes to three prime. Um, so that's what it looks like. That's what a, a five prime, three prime structure is. Yeah, so the way I draw it is I draw the phosphate first and then I draw the sugar. I do all my connections first. I do sugar, phosphate. Remember, it's always connecting at the same points. And then after that, I go to the bases. All right. So let's briefly talk about the double helix. Um, another question. Uh, phosphate sugar on the bonds and then base. Yeah, that's the way I do it. You don't, I mean, there's no correct way to do it, I guess. So doesn't matter to what O the CH connects. Um, oh, if, uh, if you're talking about a phosphate, no, it doesn't. So phosphate is all the oxygens are the same. All right, so briefly talk about the double helix. They're anti-parallel, which means, uh, whoops, sorry, forgot to get my pen out there, which means one, one strand goes five prime to three prime, and the other one just goes the opposite, five prime to three prime in the other direction. Um, bases are always in the center. They're hydrogen bonding. The outside is just negatively charged phosphate, right? And you are always going to be hydrogen bonding to your complement pair, A with T, C with G. There are many exceptions to that rule. We're not going to really worry about like all the exceptions. Um, so we're just going to say A to T, C to G. Um, the bases form a plane, so they're planar. Right? And you can have base stacking between each, um, each plane. Um, you have nine, you have hydrophobic interactions. Um, for the helix, they are right-handed, which is shown here. Um, that just means if you take your hand um, and wrap it around the helix, your thumb, your right hand, the thumb should be going with the direction of the helix. Honestly, um, I'm not going to worry about like can you do a hand and know a difference between a right-handed and a left-handed helix? What I care more about is, do you know where the bases go? Do you know what's on the outside, which are phosphates? Do you know A with T, C with G? Okay, so here is some critical thinking where I want to see what type of ideas you come up with, just like with the uracil, the thymine. 
one way that we separate strands of DNA molecules is that we add a base and we move the pH up to 11 or above 11. Can someone explain or throw out an idea of why we can separate DNA more easily under basic conditions? And if you want to talk, if you have something and you don't want to type, I, you can also do raise your hand and I can ask you to unmute or you could type it. But think about that right now. Why does DNA separate more easily at high pHs? Connecting back to what we learned last lecture about acids and bases, kind of. pH affects the integrity of the hydrogen bonds. Got it in one. Lowers hydrogen bond integrity. Yeah, so at high pH, what happens is that the hydrogens of your hydrogen bonds are more likely to come off. They will just leave the solution, or they'll leave the, the bases. Um, as the pH goes higher and higher and higher, this is more likely to happen. When you lose those hydrogens, you no longer form your hydrogen bonds. And when you don't have those hydrogen bonds holding your DNA connect, uh, together, your DNA falls apart. So very good. Uh, B, which is uh, a little more hard. Okay, NaCl. Why does adding salt make it harder for DNA to separate? That's basically what I have there. Why does adding salt to DNA make it harder to separate? And this is a fundamental chemistry question. It increases the melting point. It makes it harder to melt by adding salt. Why is it harder to separate DNA if I add salt? takes more heat, takes more energy, the more salt I add. Neutralizes the charge. Why is that important? Neutralizes what charge and why is that important? I'll say that's correct. That is the correct answer. Take it a step further. Why is neutralizing the charge important when in terms of melting? Get your chemistry hats on. In fact, let me see. Huh? Let's see, Angela. Since you answer that, Angela, do you care to uh, unmute and talk to us? Why? Why you said that it might be easier than to type it out. I don't know chemistry terminology to elaborate. I also don't have a mic, that's a shame. Uh, yeah, use non-chemistry terminology, because or so, if anyone else wants to uh, pitch in, go for it. Explain it any way you want. You don't have to use terms like I would use, like electrostatic and all that fancy stuff. So when we extract DNA in microbiology, we add salt to make it more concentrated. So that's a different effect. When you add salt what, um, to your DNA so it doesn't mix with water, that's a different effect than what's going on here. Um, yeah, so, so that, yeah, that, that's a different chemical effect. That is true though, that's all true. Um, but time is running out. So let me, let me explain. And this, this idea is kind of, understanding these two questions helps you understand the biochemical structure of DNA. Uh, charge is important for uh, non-covalent bonds. So charge is important for bonds, yes, 
but mainly non-covalent bonds. All right, so imagine I take my double helix and I'm not gonna draw a helix, I'm just gonna draw it as parallel lines. Yeah, and you have your bases. Right, so, and on the outside, you have your phosphates. So your DNA is very negative. For every base, you have a negative phosphate. So DNA has two forces competing against each other. Uh, well, three forces. So holding DNA together, you have hydrogen bonds that are holding DNA together. You also have this idea of base stacking. I don't know if you remember from organic chemistry, but when you have bases that are made out of carbon on top of each other, that's a favorable interaction, like a sandwich. So you have this base stacking interaction holding DNA together. But pushing DNA away, that is DNA is repelling each other because you have two large negative strands you're trying to bring together they naturally don't want to be next to each other, right? So if you add more salt, salt is made out of sodium, positive, and chlorine minus. What's going to happen is that this salt will come in and interact with the phosphates, the negative charge of the phosphates. And so what's going to happen is called charge screening. By putting positive charges next to a negative charges, the negative charges now don't really recognize each other. They don't feel each other as strongly. So the repulsion between the DNA is going down. And in fact, it is like impossible, nearly impossible to take DNA and remove all its salt because the negative charge of DNA is so high you will always have magnesium. That's the salt that's in DNA. Um, so DNA will always be with magnesium. But um, those are the forces in play with DNA. Hydrogen bonds, holding it together. Base stacking, holding it together. And negative charges, um, pushing it apart. All right. And so we have one more question, but that will take like five minutes. So we'll, we'll cover that on Monday, um, as always. Um, let me get out of the stop share. Uh, as always, if you have any questions for me, let me know. I will be putting this online as always, be putting up a homework there. Um, and otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday. You say you wish this class was longer until you're in my hour and 15 Tuesday, Thursday sections, which I run sometimes. And then I can see people's faces after about the hour mark and 50 minutes is a good time for stuff like this. Um, all right, I will see some of you on Tuesday. If you have lab in the second section, I will see you on person on Tuesday. I'll make an announcement for that in your lab section. Otherwise, see everybody on Wednesday.